birthday and happy October. I'm glad fall is actually here. Um, but even though it's going to be hot this week, I'm not ready for that. Um, today we are going to hear from Samuel Jeffrey. And he is here at Tabor through the Noctegal Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. Last week we heard from Denver Bierman. He was also part of that lecture series. And you're probably wondering what that is, so I'm going to tell you. Um, it is a lecture series that was put here from Dean and Carol Noctegal. It's designed to bring high-profile, nationally recognized guest lectures to Tabor. And we want to share or listen to their experiences and share some insights with you and hope really just to um, get you excited about your careers and inspire you for your future so that you can make a difference wherever that is that you are. It's got entrepreneurship in the title, and that's why it's housed in the business department. But really, entrepreneurship is more about creativity and innovation and being passionate and innovative wherever God takes you in your career. So um, I'm actually not going to tell you much about Samuel Jeffries or Jeffrey because he has his own story, and I would probably um, not do it justice. So I'm going to bring him up here and just let him um, tell you about his amazing story. And so we go to them and say, hey, what's going on? You know, can we, 
maybe you know a place you can stay, and they said, well, we're staying at the convent. No men are allowed under any circumstances in the convent. They, they were fleeing their previous convent that had been overrun by the rebels and were, were coming to Byron. And they said, we can't take you to the convent, but we have a flatbed truck, and you can ride on the back of that, and we'll take you to a hotel. All right, so it's 11 o'clock, so we pile on the back of this uh, flatbed truck and are driving through these, you know, streets that have just been bombed out. And uh, so I mean, we're just rattling through. Every hotel we go through or go to is either closed or one, or one of them had, uh, you know, somebody had sprayed automatic gunfire in the front of the hotel, which is a good indicator you don't want to stay there. It's a little trip <laughs> advisor. Um, <laughs> So we keep looking around for a place to stay. Every place is closed. It's like Bethlehem. There's no room in the inn at all. And at 2 in the morning, they've been driving us around Byra for three hours. These nuns look at us and they say, look, we have to get to our convent. If we don't get to our convent, they're going to start thinking something's happened to us. They're going to send out search parties, and then that puts the search parties in the risk. So we're going to go to this one last place. And... If they can let you in, great. If not, we're going to drop you off, and you're just going to have to spend the night on the street. So everything gets pretty tense, and we pull up to this big 10-foot wall. If you've been in the third world, you've seen walls like this. 10-foot wall with broken glass cemented on the top, big steel gate out front, and we pound on the gate, and it doesn't take long. Night guard comes up, and he starts talking in Portuguese, but when he starts hearing us speaking in English, he transitions to English, and he asks me a question that is one of the formative questions that I've been asked in my life. And at 2 in the morning, in Byron, Mozambique, after the nuns dropped us off, we knock on the gate, and he hears us talking in English, and he says, Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yeah, yeah, we believe that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the gate opened. It ended up that that was a Baptist guest house. And I was a freshman in high school. I'm 40 now. I still get choked up talking about it. It was one of the most formative experiences in my life. And it took place in the course of about 30 seconds at that gate. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I do. The gate opened. That is what it looks like when you're in a war zone. You see, I didn't, I, I'm not Mennonite, I didn't grow up uh, um, with, with some of the same traditions that you guys from a, have from a faith perspective, but I can guarantee you this. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and if you believe the same thing, we've got far more in common than what separates us. We live in a nation that is divided in every possible way, right? Socioeconomic, racial, political, whatever, it's divided. And yet, um, I'm the director of the criminal justice program. I teach people how to be cops and go to the military already. And uh, one of our uh, alumni who is African American, uh, he, he, he graduated, I guess, in 2015, so about three years ago. You may have heard about this. He was in his apartment in Dallas, and a cop came in, and uh, I mean, it's obviously there's, this, the details of the story are controversial, and I don't want to, I don't want to make that a point of what I'm talking about. But basically, he's in his own apartment. Cop comes in, and he gets killed. He's unarmed. He's in his own apartment. The cop thought it was her apartment, uh, or that, that's her story. I don't know anything to refute that. You don't either. Um, but here's the deal. I went to that guy's funeral, right? Botham, Shim, John. Uh, went to his funeral in Dallas. One of the most beautiful things I'd ever been a part of. Um, African American church. I don't know if you've noticed. I'm not African American. Um, I thought, man, there, there could be some tension here, you know? And I'm really kind of ashamed <laughs> that I had that thought. Because I walked in. And there was nothing but kindness and love in that room. They had, when we were leaving, I, I drove from Harvard.
morning down, which was about seven hours, went to the funeral, and then got the, in the van and drove back to Harding. So it was a long, a lot of time in the car that day. Um, but the family, his dad, both of them's dad gets up and says, look, I know some of y'all are, are leaving. We've packed box lunches for you so that you can go. But if you can stay, we've set a table, and we'd love for you to have a meal with us. That type of situation cannot happen outside of Christ. There's far too much that divides us. There's far too much that divides us. But in Christ, those gaps are bridged, right? But here's the deal. We, we don't do enough. We talk a lot as a society. We talk a lot. And so I'm gonna I want to read some scripture to you here really quick, um, and uh, and then get into it. Uh, it's Matthew chapter five. Uh, I'm gonna read one through nine. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted." Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to say it goes on. For 10 years, I worked at the CIA, uh, special agent with them. The bulk of my time was as an interrogator. Um, I did some force protection stuff, some personnel protection stuff as well. But obviously that's not the typical profession, right? I, I don't know, once I left Virginia, um, I'm not, I haven't met too many other CIA special agents, former special agents. Um, so when I read through those first nine verses of Matthew chapter 5, my eye goes to the peacemaker. Um, because in my mind, peace, peacemaker is what law enforcement should be, what it is in the, best, uh, in the best circumstances. So my eye goes to peacemaker, and when I look at it, one of the things that I see is that it doesn't say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for peace. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but it doesn't say that about peace. Um, it doesn't say, uh, blessed are those who have a peaceful spirit. It says, blessed are those who are pure in spirit. When it talks about peace, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, so here's my question to you guys. What are you going to do? I mean, what are, what are you going to do? You, you've got strong convictions, right? You, there's stuff that you believe in and you believe firmly in. It. And let me, let me if, I, if you don't remember... Well, I want you to remember the Jesus part. But other than that, remember this part, right? Nobody cares. Nobody cares. You can have strong beliefs. You can have strong opinions. Nobody cares. You're not changing anybody's life with your strong opinions. Don't ever mistake strong emotion for action. It's a totally different thing, right? We want to, we want to gripe. We want to complain. We want to look at the people who are in charge of our society or who run different aspects of the society whether we're talking about government or church or school or anything else and say, I could do it better. But you know what? You're not doing it. So hush. Hush. Get to work. Blessed are the peacemakers. It is an active thing. It does not matter what your emotions are. What matters is what are you going to do? Our society is suffering from epidemic levels of suicide and depression and anxiety, and you, you guys know y'all fit that, right? There's epidemic levels of suicide, or not suicide, hopefully, but depression and anxiety on this campus, right? It, you know you fit that. We all do. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not trying to say that there's, you know, I don't, and I don't want to get into the clinical aspects of mental health, and I'm not trying to disparage that either. But what I am trying to say is so much of that is because our nation and the people in it lack a mission. What are you here for? Right? You're not here to, to gripe. Right? The, we, we get ill at ease because as Christians we strap 
on the full armor of God that sit in a chair. It wasn't made for that. It's uncomfortable. It should be. Get up and do something. The deal is, our, our people, our nation lacks a mission. And you don't. So how do you share the mission? How do you share the mission? Um, I, I got roped into to CIA. I mean, I was uh, telling Stacy this this morning. Um, I was actually, it's a long convoluted story, but the bottom line is um, somebody that I knew, uh, I went to, there was a park that had uh, piglets were born. It was like one of those farm parks where you can take the kids and look at how farm runs do. So piglets have been born. I had little girls, so we, my wife and I took the piglets. <laughs> That's got to stay here. That does not uh, so we took we took the girls to go see the piglets, and when uh, when we got there, there was this guy that I knew. He was there with his family, and he said, "Hey, why don't you let your family go? Your wife and kids go walk with my wife and kids. Let's sit down and have a chat." We sit down, and he essentially tells me, "I don't work for who you think I work for. I work for the CIA." And we thought he'd come on board. And I told Stacy, I'm in. You know, I should have asked, like, is this a paying position? Is this something that got benefits? <laughs> nah, because you can't have that story and it lead up to me being like, mm, no. Like, the story, I, I'm in. I'm in, absolutely. And I'm, I'm so thankful for my time there. And I'm, I, and I'm so thankful that I could leave there with confidence knowing there are good men and women still fighting that fight. But I... My exit from CIA started on September 12th, or September 11th, 2012. Right? Everybody, when we talk about the September 11th attacks, everybody thinks 20, or 2001, and the, with good reason, but there was also some attacks that took place in Benghazi, Libya on 11 September 2012. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details of the attack, but basically, at 9.40 that evening, People, security guys looking on the camera saw a mob moving towards them. There hadn't been anything going on all day. It had been a pretty dead day. In fact, most of the people had turned in for the night. Uh, and on 940 that night, I started seeing an armed crowd moving towards uh, the compound. Uh, there was small arms, uh, AK-47s mainly, <laughs> rocket propelled grenades, um, and, and some other improvised explosive devices uh, that were used. And very quickly, that com that compound in Benghazi, Libya, gets overrun. Uh, it's the the story is tragic and it's long, and I don't I don't want to get into it. Um, mainly because I'd probably get emotional as I was talking about it. But the bottom line is, it's overrun, and a call goes out for help. The people who are trapped get on the radio, and they're calling out to people in D.C. saying. We need help. And there were, in D.C., there was meetings being held to say, you know, what can we do? Where's our, um, you know, where's our quickest reaction force? It was like, you know, we had some Marines that were in Rota, Spain. We had some uh, special forces guys that were in uh, Croatia doing some training. And the thought was we could rally those guys and get them there pretty fast. Uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta told the Marines in Rota, Spain, get geared up. We're going to go. Um, and they did eventually go, but there was a lot of vacillating. Right in Washington, and but the, but the deal was they weren't the people trapped in that compound weren't just calling out to Washington. There was a CIA base about three four blocks from there, referred to as the Annex, and they were listening. And CIA special agents were there. The global response staff. This is all public information. I'm not telling you anything that's classified. Um, Global response staff was there, and they're equipped to go. Now, there's, by some estimates, 150, 200 armed uh, militia attacking the compound, and there was about five of them. So it's not necessarily a fair fight, but they came for the fight. Um, and so they go to their boss and say, look, boss, this is happening it's four blocks away. We need to go. And the boss says, look, we need security here. So if we send you out, we're going to be vulnerable. It's a no-go. Right? If you've seen the movie 13 Hours, you, you, you know the, the rest of the story. Those guys
guys eventually, after being told to stand down a few times, gathered up and said, look, of the team leaders said, look, um, I, it's, you're not under orders, but there's people down there that need help. So if you don't want to do this, stand down. And nobody stood down. They had a mission. It worked out well for all of them. Two guys died. In fact, two of them were on, their names are on the bracelet that I wear every day. Um, just in, in memorial to them. They had a mission and they went to it. It's one of the things that, that blows my mind when I start thinking about September 11th, right? September 11th, 20, 2001. It's even, it's the same thing on a different scale. You realize we had 400, around 400 Firefighters and law enforcement killed on September 11, 2001. But did you know that the radio repeaters were down? Right? The radios that they listened to, the thing that caught the signal and boosted it, got it out to them, was on top of the World Trade Center. It was the highest point. It made sense to put the radio repeaters there. Right? But when the planes hit, the repeater went down. They couldn't hear their command and control. So not only did we have around 400 firefighters and law enforcement go in, but they did it on their own. They weren't ordered to duty. They saw their duty in front of them and moved towards it. Now, I recognize that, um, that there are some of you in this crowd who may disagree with my work at the CIA. Right? But here's the great thing. Um, it's, there's, there's a, a lot of relief that comes with that. Um, but here's what I'm going to tell you to, to drive this point home. Because this is bigger than law enforcement. This, I mean, it, it, it's bigger than all, all that. Because we're talking about the gospel. Right? If you go upstairs here, and I'm, I, I don't want to get this wrong because I just saw this this morning. But upstairs, um, there's kind of a eerie sculpture up there. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I will admit the first thought I have is, that thing's creepy. <laughs> um, and so, I stopped to read it. 20 million, is it in memorial of Holodomor? Holodomor? Whatever. I don't know the name. Basically, a forced genocide, or, or yeah, a forced um, starvation of uh, people of Ukraine, up to 20. 20 million Ukrainians passed away. 250,000 uh, Mennonites, according to what was up there, um, either died or fled the area. Don't be under the impression <coughs> that that is just the stuff of history. Don't be that ignorant. That stuff goes on all the time. You, you, you People will talk about you know concentration camps and how horrible it was. And if I was if I lived then, then you know I no way the Nazis would do that. <clears throat> give me a give me a computer. I'll show you where camp, concentration camps are right now on Google Maps. Not that hard to find. I can even get you driving directions. Right? What are you going to do? Nobody cares about your opinions. They care about what do you do? Wisdom has never saved anyone. Not one person has been saved by wisdom. Wisdom in action is what saves people. Nobody cares what you know. They don't care how you feel. They don't care about your opinions or what you're offended by. They care about what you do. Being offended is a waste of emotion. It's a waste of energy. What are you going to do? Right? You're not called to sit here. You're not called just to learn and then go get into a cubicle and do your work and go home. That's not it. If you do that, you have failed. You are called to lead. You are called to something bigger than what uh, we're dealing with, uh, than, than what's immediately in front of you. Uh, Harding uh, University, where I teach right now, is, is doing a campus read on the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. It's a great book. Uh, it's not my favorite C.S. Lewis book. Uh, my 
my favorite C.S. Lewis book is the screw tape letters. The screw tape letters, uh, the premise is uh, obviously it's, it's a work of fiction kind of. In the introduction, what he says, C.S. Lewis says was, I'm not going to, I will never explain to anyone how I came into to having, came into possession of this correspondence, but it's correspondence between an older demon advising a younger demon on how to take people away from the Lord, how to, how to lead people astray. And so the book is these letters between these two demons going back and forth, and it, and it illuminates so much, and it's a real easy read because the letters are really short. Um, and so you can read a piece and kind of think about it for a little bit and, and, and move on. But there's a line in there that has hit me squarely every time I, I think about it. And the line is this. The older demon talking to the younger demon uh, says, you know, the, the book takes place during World War II. The correspondence supposedly took place during World War II as World War II is breaking out across Europe. And the older demon says, look, it may be tempting for our people, the demons, to think that war is a good thing, right? Because of all the evils that are rampant, right? Man's inhumanity to man, um, all the horrible things. But remember that war also causes people to think deeper. It causes them to ask questions they would not otherwise ask. And this is the line that sticks with me. The old demon tells the younger, you must keep your patient's eyes focused on the enemy. You must keep their eyes focused on what is right in front of them. Because if he lifts his eyes to eternity, our game is lost. If he lifts his eyes to eternity, hurting. The world is chaos. The world is in desperate need of a solution. And you, the only thing you have to offer is the only real solution. Jesus Christ. It is in desperate need of peace. And the only thing that you to that. It's not your degree. It's not your, um, I don't know, you all have the MRS degree here? Uh, we have <laughs> it's not your significant other, right? Um, you, none of that helps. That doesn't do anything. One of the most frustrating things about being at the CIA is you're sitting there watching them spend literally billions of dollars to try and fix something that can only be fixed by the return of Jesus Christ. It's probably the most frustrating thing, right? You're trying to fix something that can't be fixed, right? From my perspective, what I was trying to do was mitigate that, right? Mitigate the effects of the fallen world, to stand up for, um, for people who can't stand up for themselves. That's, that's what most of us are trying to do. But you can't use a man-made solution to a divine problem. <laughs> the only thing that will fix the world Christ. And that is the only thing you can bring to the table. That sculpture up there has a, a poem that's attached to it. And it uh, I promise I came with my own ending for this. And yes, we're about to end, so um, you can get excited about that. But I promise I came with my own ending. But when I read the poem, the ending of it to me summed this up better. Than, than I could. It says, after detailing all of the nastiness of war and all of the tragedy that's taken place and still takes place, it, it, the, the poem even mentions uh, Iraq, which I think is an obvious reference to the war in Iraq, um, that the, the, the tragedies that took place in the Ukraine are still ever present, right? The poem ends with this. I can't say it any better. There is sunlight in our view and much to do. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Don't be people of words. Don't be the 20-year-old sage. Right? Because a 20-year-old sage doesn't exist. Right? Neither does a 40-year-old. Have any major you want. You can go into any field that 
witness throughout Scripture. Uh, people doing all kinds of work. And even Jesus, you know, we kind of assume he was a carpenter because his dad was a carpenter. Do you think people ever brought stuff back to him for shoddy work? You know, do you think his witness was compromised by the poor way he did his job? No, not at all. I guarantee you that that stuff was top notch, right? I guarantee you put in the work that was needed, kind of a good quality product. There's ample evidence you can do whatever from a professional standpoint, but make no mistake. If you're doing it right, you're doing it for the Lord. You can have that impact. One of the most embarrassing things, I told Stacy this this morning, one of the most embarrassing things about being at CI was my last summer there before I went full-time to Harding. Um, somebody said, hey, we're having a prayer meeting um, every morning, and we'd like you to join us when you want to I said, absolutely, man. I'd love that. And so I show up at 7 o'clock that morning, and I walked in there, and it was a room with people who were known for doing shoddy work. It was a room with people who were known to complain about being given work. In short, it was the people that I don't want to be associated with. I'm in a prayer meeting. And so imagine my confusion when I find a prayer meeting that I really don't want to be a part of at all. Um, I, I went that one time and never went back. Now, you can argue I should have gone back and tried to change that culture or whatever. I, I get that. I'm not 